Thank you all for being here. Good to see you. My name is Rebecca Trawick and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm the director and curator of the Wignall Museum of Contemporary Art, a teaching museum located on the Rancho Cucamonga campus of Chapey College. Thank you for joining us to, for today's program featuring Yvette M. Pino, presented as part of the Collective Care series and in collaboration with the Faculty Success Center. Collective Care is an ongoing collaborative series of programs developed by the Center for Culture and Social Justice, or CCSJ, and the Wignall Museum of Contemporary Art. Collective care programs are often organized in concert with fellow student service areas on campus. Collective care brings together scholars, activists, artists, and community experts to explore contemporary issues that affect Chapey College student lives. Through the Collective Care series, we hope to foster a sense of belonging, strengthen identities, challenge stigmas, and continue to commit to being lifelong learners and advocates for a socially just world. Further, today's program is part of a series of programs presented in honor of Veterans Appreciation Week at JP College. A special shout out to veterans who are with us today, including Yvette. On behalf of all the areas represented here today, we thank you for your service. Next, I'd like to introduce Faculty Success Center facilitator, Cindy Walker, who will share our land acknowledgement and share a bit about this short faculty only discussion immediately following Yvette's presentation. Cindy? Thank you, Becca. Um, with respect and honor for the lands that we gather on and the leaders before us, we acknowledge the Gabrielino Tongva peoples, the original stewards of these sacred and unceded homelands, the Tongva people's history, languages, cultural traditions, and legacy continue to shape this region, and we recognize their continuing presence in their homelands. In the spirit of truth and equity, Chafee College commits to uplifting the voices of Indigenous peoples, building an inclusive and equitable educational environment, and decolonizing the institution. We also encourage members of the Chafee College community to learn about the land they reside on and the original caretakers and advocate for culturally responsive action. Briefly here, I will introduce Yvette. Um, and, but wanted to let you know that uh, she'll be presenting for about 50 minutes. And as time allows, um, we can uh, also do some Q&A. So if you do have questions, feel free to jot, jot them down. You can include them in the chat now. And we will uh, get to as many as we possibly can during that time. So uh, please, without further ado, allow me to introduce our esteemed guest, Yvette M. Pino. Motivated by honest conversations and a belief that everyone and everything has a story, Yvette M. Pino harnesses her artistic ability to interpret these narratives. While deployed to Iraq in 2003 with the 101st Airborne Division, she was tasked to paint murals and was coined the unofficial division artist. Painting in the field often encouraged discussions between artist and audience and would fundamentally influence Ms. Pino's creation of the Veteran Print Project. Over the last 10 plus years, the Veteran Print Project has paired more than 100 veterans with artists to exchange a dialogue that resulted in an edition of prints based on the veteran story. The artwork has exhibited nationally and has been recognized by NPR's All Things Considered and has been licensed by the ABC Studios for use in television stage sets. Pino is a research artist who served in the military for over 12 years. This investigation of veteran as artist has revealed the impact of that experience on the artist's uh, oeuvre. It has gleaned an extensive record of veterans who not only create powerful bodies of work when returning home, uh, but who also built the foundations of monumental art programs across the United States and globally. Yvette Ampino earned her BFA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and received a certificate in museum studies from Northwestern University. She was a National Endowment for the Humanities Curatorial Fellow for the 2019 National Veteran Art Museum Triennial, Triennial and Veteran Arts Summit. Pino you know, served on the Madison Arts Commission from 2013 to 2021 and is the Curator of Veteran Art for the Wisconsin Veterans Museum in Madison, Wisconsin, where she recently curated artwork for the award-winning historic renovation of the Milwaukee Soldiers Home by the Alexander Company. So please join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to Yvette Pino. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for that. Um, I'm gonna share my screen with you all uh, as I start 
this presentation. So good afternoon. Thank you everybody for being with us today. And thank you, Rebecca, of course, for that wonderful introduction and for inviting me to speak with all of you today. Thank you, Roman, for the behind the scenes administrative support. And of course, thank you to Chafee for welcoming me to speak with all of you today. I mentioned in my social media post in uh, telling everybody about this show that I'm grateful for all of these recent projects that I've had on the West Coast uh, over the last few years. I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I, every time I feel like I'm getting closer and closer to the West Coast, I have a nostalgia for, for being home. So it, get, it gets me a little homesick. So thank you for this invitation. Uh, this new world of digital presentations opens up uh, new opportunities for artists to reach a broader audience and for institutions to welcome visiting artists like myself without the extra financial barriers of uh, travel expenses and the drama of scheduling conflicts. So uh, I'm really excited to be a privilege to be I'm really excited to be here as not only a participant as a visiting artist in this platform, but I get to host similar events like this uh, in the other creative roles that I'm that I'm in. So I appreciate the value of this platform. Now today I know I have a lot of time to talk to you, but I also know just how quickly that time will speed by. So I'm going to dive right in and get started. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Yvette M. Pino. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm an Army veteran, an artist, and a printmaker. I'm also a curator. And today I'm really excited because I'll be discussing my work on all of those fronts. Uh, work uh, like the Veteran Print Project. And the Veteran Print Project, in the simplest terms, is this. A veteran meets an artist, a conversation happens, a print is made. We'll be discussing the how to all of that throughout the artist talk today. I'll also be able to discuss some of my responsibilities that I've had uh, working as the curator of veteran art at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. And last but certainly not least, I'm going to be able to share elements of my own personal body of artwork, which is really exciting because as a curator and with the Veteran Print Project, I don't always get a chance to do that. So I get to share some of my own artwork with you today. So first, a little bit of background. Uh, I was in the United States Army and I served with the 101st Airborne Division. I deployed twice to Iraq, once in 0304 and again in 0506. And I was really lucky because while I was deployed, I got to paint murals. Now there's a much longer story to how I became the, the unofficial division artist and how I painted these murals. But for the sake of time today, really what you need to know is that I served in the army and I got to paint while I was overseas in my deployments. Um, I got, when I say I painted murals, really I was doing these large scale reproductions of unit crests or the division patch like you see here on these giant helipads. These are 30 foot by 60 foot helipads into Crit Iraq. Um, I had to do four of those. Uh, so really, again, what you need to know is I was in the army and I got to paint murals while I was in the army. And now I'm gonna get all curatorial with you, a little graphic designy because I'm gonna use the rule of thirds and I'm gonna break down how this integral moment in time, how me painting murals in Iraq was integral of my future artistic career. Number one, painting murals in the army laid the groundwork for what would become the Veteran Print Project. Like I said, you're gonna be hearing a lot about this throughout this talk. Number two, painting murals in Iraq inspired my future research, the research I do today, which is examining the artists in the field. What do we artists do when we are in a military deployment? And three, painting murals in Iraq cultivated the innovative techniques and the mental endurance that I would need as an artist working with minimal supplies and time. So all, all of this happened is just important as what it revealed. Um, I was unaware of it at the time, but most people who paint or work in the creative sector know, people just love to watch other people make art, don't they? They love to watch us and the creative process. As you can see in three, two, one, ah, oh, the audience applause. 
Yes, we made a print using a steamroller as a giant printing press because people love to watch the process and ask questions. And as artists, whether it comes naturally or whether we have to adapt, we have to learn to communicate what we are doing in real time while people are watching because they're mesmerized by what we do and they wanna know more, they wanna know how. And if you can embrace that, then you can understand that there's a bigger opportunity for conversations that are gonna occur organically through that type of interaction. For example, imagine this, I'm in Kuwait. You don't really have to imagine too hard because here's a picture of it. I'm in Kuwait. It's somewhere between 100 and 115 degrees. We, the soldiers, are usually, not in this picture, but we're usually wearing our full battle rattle, which means our flak vest, our Kevlar, our mop gear, which is our chemical protection suit uh, and gas mask. Remember, it's 2003. We still had to don our mask when the alarm would sound. All of that you can see is in that little pouch on the back of my thigh there. All of that was packed and on our person. And I'm standing in front of this concrete barrier otherwise known as a Jersey barrier, those things you see on highway road construction. And I'm attempting to apply paint to this baking block while in conversation with two guys I've never met before. Uh, and during this exchange, I learned who these guys are. What unit were they with? What was their job? Uh, what are their likes? What are their dislikes? What music do they listen to? You get the idea, right? Like I'm getting to know these guys. And they're super excited when I tell them, sure, I'll make these two figures in this painting. I'll make them you. I'll personalize it to you. Just spell your name out on a piece of paper so that I paint it correctly on this block. Now, this was not one of my finest piece of artworks. As you can see in the picture, I did not use this and submit this in my portfolio for art school. But what I learned that day is that exchange with those two guys, um, I was, I've never forgotten that they took a few minutes of their precious times in the blaze, blazing sun to talk to me just days before. This was literally just a few days before we crossed the border into Iraq to start the war in 2003. Um, that, and in my defense of this painting, I had a half inch size brush to paint that whole thing. So <laughs> I, I just, the, the important part of this is that exchange between me and those guys. That interaction, gave me something to talk about with everybody else that would come before me in those next few days while I was painting that mural. I was able to tell them who those people were in that painting. It wasn't just two random people from a history book. It wasn't anonymous faces on a wall with military subject matter. It was guys that you might be sitting across from at the chow hall. It was guys that you were going to be arm in arm, hand in hand with as we crossed the border into Iraq. And that moment also gave those two guys something to talk about on that last phone call home that they were able to make before we jumped. This moment right here is where I learned about the power of art as a catalyst for conversation. Now moments like that happen not just once, not twice, but every single time I was able to draw and paint in the army, which fortunately for me was really quite often I got to meet a lot of people. I was a cook in the army, so everybody has to eat. Between people coming to eat and me painting murals and people coming to watch me make art, I learned a lot about the people I was serving with. And they were learning a lot about me. And of course, they now knew that I could draw and paint, right? So often I was asked to create a portrait of a fellow soldier in the field, which I did. Now these portraits I just drew recently, all those portraits I did in the field, I gave to the people that asked me to do them. So I don't have any pictures of that, but I was able to draw portraits. And while I was doing that, what I, re what I, re what I didn't realize then was that was also guiding me toward the future research that I would be doing right now. And that's considering what artists do while they're in the field. And unsurprisingly, portrait illustration goes all the way back through every generation of military service. One of the earliest accounts I read about this was written by Pliny the Elder. Pliny the Elder was a Roman naval commander. He was one of the first art historians, one of the first military historians. And I call him one of the first, it's because his writings have existed and haven't been destroyed by the test of time. But he has a conversation in his writing about the origins of painting. He started a debate of where painting really came from. And he tells the story about a girl in Corinth 
She's the daughter of Butati's and her lover is going off to battle the next day. And so she creates this silhouette portrait of him as a keepsake before he heads off to battle. And her father was a ceramicist and he created from that silhouette, a clay tile that he put on the roofing tiles that he was making. And that's kind of that first indicator, their yellow ribbon, right? Something to identify that this household has somebody that's going off to battle. And if you're not familiar what a light silhouette portrait is, uh, you could see we did this for a drink and draw event at the, Madison, at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum on Valentine's Day. I had people come and create silhouettes to remember me by. But in order to do this, you need a light source. Often it would be back in the day, it would be a candle or the sunlight. And you have somebody sit in profile and it projects that profile onto the surface that you're drawing. And you outline it and then you fill it in. And now you have this two-dimensional essence of somebody's profile, right? Or in the case of depot, uh, uh, of the girl in Corinth, her father three-dimensionalizes it by making it into a roofing tile, right? What I'm trying to get to the point is, is that we create these keepsakes, portraits create these keepsakes. In World War II, they called them snaps, like snapshots, right? Cameras haven't always been available or allowed, but I think there's a stronger sense to the handmade. Uh, this is from Harold Schmitz. I curated an exhibit of his in 2019 at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. And he actually was getting commissioned to create these, these, uh, these portraits. Um, most of them were he would have his soldiers sit and pose for a portrait or they would bring him a little photograph of their loved one, of their sweetheart, that they wanted him to make a handmade drawing. And there's nothing against the artistic integrity of the, the photograph or the photographer, but people just seem to be much more, there's an intimacy behind a hand-drawn, right? There's a vulnerability to sitting for a portrait. Um, so thinking it, cameras haven't always been available either or accessible or even allowed. So think about the vulnerability that encourages and more intimate exchange and connectivity. Somebody's intentionally staring at you for a long period of time. Examining drawings by w Wisconsin World War II veteran Santo Zingali, um, I started exploring the underlying sentiment behind the gaze of the subject toward the artist. How is the person being depicted looking back at you, right? There's a myriad of storytelling that's found simply by studying the eyesight and the body language. And you can start to identify the different levels of vulnerability, right? There's a level of vulnerability in each one of these people that the artist is depicting. Sometimes they're uncomfortable. They don't like to be stared at. Sometimes they're unaware that they're even being drawn to unchecked fear, that like far off gaze, I see it in a lot of the drawings I was drawing of my fellow soldiers, that looking off into the unknown, the fear of the unknown, what is, the, what is tomorrow going to bring? Um, so that's that unchecked fear, all the way to skirting the lines of narcissism, like the guy in the bottom right there. Um, so that vulnerability of sitting, uh, of sitting for a portrait, that would become a very interesting part of the components of the veteran print project, right? This, this exercise in trust, the, the trust between artist and subject. Uh, when I talk about trust with my participants of the veteran print project, uh, I tell the veterans that are participating, this is an exercise in trust because you have to trust that you are offering your story to another person and they are going to listen to it and they are going to absorb it and they're going to translate it and visually depict it. And, and that makes you vulnerable. You don't know what the end result is going to be, but you have to trust that that conversation is going to be meaningful and it's going to be reciprocal. And so take the time, trust in the artist, trust in the process, see what might come out of it. When I'm talking to the artists of the Veteran Print Project, I tell them this is an exercise in trust because you as an artist have to trust in your artistic capabilities, trust in your style, trust in what you do best. Don't change who you are. Don't change the style of your artwork to fit the person, the subject that you're depicting. Do what you do best, listen to the story, and hope that what you produce will be accepted by the veteran. And do we get it right 100% of the time? Absolutely not. There are moments where we have missed opportunities, where the artist doesn't capture what the veteran thought they would capture. And 
we don't like, uh, we're not upset about that. That's part of the process, right? That opens up even more lines of dialogue, more conversations, more learning experiences come out of that. Why did we miss the mark? What happened? There's no wrong answer in the Veteran Print Project. It's about conversations. And that is the exercise and trust that you think about when you're doing portrait uh, drawing. When I write about artists in the field, I note an occurrence of a specific type of mark making that implies the literal marking of the passage of time. If you're familiar with drill and ceremony, then you may know that the phrase marking time means to march in place. Each step neither advances nor retreats, but it marches steadily to nowhere. So too are the marks made by some of these artists whose marks, whose brush strokes, whose pencil marks match the passage of time, like we see in the work by Civil War veteran John Gaddis. He often painted when he was on sentry duty, which means he's on guard duty, right? And any one of us that has served on guard duty means that you have to stay awake and alert for long periods of time. And if you're an artist, that means capturing what's around you. And so you can see John Gaddis in the foreground. He was often on a hill down looking troops on a field drilling, drilling troops. But I started writing about Gaddis because each little individual watercolor brushstroke uh, doesn't have, it doesn't give a lot of information, right? But it literally is the tick tock of the clock of time going by. And when you zoom out, like in an impressionist painting, it, it has the whole composition is actually showing you the laborious movement of troops. Like you see the movement in these troops, but you also see not only the laborious movement of the troops, but the laborious passage of time while sitting on guard duty. So I'm starting to think about how these marks on paper in the artwork of this, these veterans comes to play in the passage of time. In my own artwork, I've also embraced this repetitive and this meditative mark making. Uh, part of my line work started because I wanted to add some more graphic sensibilities to my compositions. But I also found that this repetitive line work is also a great way to layer symbolism into the work. Uh, the most common repetitive line or symbol that I use is derived from my attraction to the ritual from my compulsion to say the Hail Mary and the soothing nature of praying the rosary, which of course is the influence of the Catholic iconography that surrounded me in my youth. At some point I realized uh, in the military that uh, the silhouette on a range card that we use to qualify with our weapons, uh, that silhouette can look like the Virgin Mary, which then translates to a woman wearing a headscarf or a hijab, right? Especially if you put the crosshairs on the range card silhouette, it really has that emblematic, that iconic uh, Virgin Mary silhouette with the halo. I have one distinct, very distinct memory in Iraq where I am pointing my weapon at a woman wearing a headscarf and she's holding a child. And I realized at that moment that I was pointing my weapon at the Virgin Mary. Uh, the rep repetition in my line work has so many layered symbols, but for the most part, these repetitions of lines are a literal translation of my self-inflicted penance and a need for me to reconcile my beliefs uh, with my actions, with my experiences. <clears throat> marked time, when we look at marked time, it is the essence of captured memory. All of these drawings are mementos and these mementos become more than just a keepsake. They're heirlooms. In an essay called Notes on the Post-Indexical, the author is writing about Pliny. If you, if you remember me talking about Pliny earlier, his story is not just the story about the origins of painting, but it is a story about loss and strategies of remembrance. I just think the phrase strategies of remembrance is so beautiful. And if we're talking about loss, we have to remember, we're not just talking about loss of life. We're talking about loss of a family member being removed from the fam family unit and is taken away for a long period of time in deployment, right? So loss isn't just death. Loss is separation from a loved one. And 
these drawings are strategies to remember, right? These drawings, this passage of time, for me, in my opinion, it's the preparation for all for a time to come when all you have is memory, right? Or when memory is being taken from you. These artworks aren't always fully realized images, whether it's because uh, guard duty ended and you didn't have time to finish it, or uh, they're just marked literal passages of time. It makes them not really fully image, uh, fully realized. And that makes that heirloom now a designated space to remember. Those two beautiful elements came out of that essay and that strategies of remembrance and designated spaces to remember. It's really important that we offer ourselves these moments, whether it's visually or meditatively, we need to give ourselves designated spaces to remember. If we're considering giving space to remember, I wanna share with you a realization I came to in 2018. Uh, most of you may know that 2018 was the 100 year commemoration, the anniversary of the signing of the armistice that ended World War I. Many in my field had been researching for years and preparing for the exhibits, the events, and the discussions about this historic topic. Now, for some reason, World War I is one of those specialized history topics, one of the conflicts that's rarely discussed in America prior to the centennial. Now, obviously, World War II, right, is considered the creator of the greatest generation. So, of course, it's going to be the most commonly discussed conflict in our nation's history beyond the Civil War. Yes, we discuss Vietnam, we discuss Iraq and Afghanistan, and there's a few wars that some people refer to as the Forgotten Wars, like Korea and the Gulf War. And World War I sometimes finds itself in that category of the Forgotten War. Um, but what is always confusing to those of us that do study World War I is the lack of discussions about it, because it really was the catalyst for much of the current political perspective and policy that we see today. So during strategic planning sessions at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum at the end of 2018, we were considering this question, why does it still matter? Why does the final narrative and the decisions that were made at the end of World War I still continue to affect world politics and policy today? And the overarching sentiment was this, which is really in most institutions of humanities, right? We need to remind, we need to revisit this history, a continual revisitation of this history, specifically World War I, to remind us, to remind our audiences why we find ourselves immersed in certain situations today, just a short 100 years later. Yesterday affects today, how? And how does today affect tomorrow? This was a revelation for me. In 2018, there were so many events going on to commemorate this 100 year anniversary. And during this time, I was working with a group of musicians in Madison, Wisconsin, who were creating uh, content for a concert called The Greatest War, World War I, Wisconsin, and Why It Still Matters. And they dubbed it a rock and roll history show. I loved it. The kissers, John Wedge, who you see pictured here, he's a historian and a member of the periodicals, Sean Michael Dargan, the November Criminals, a hip hop polka group in Milwaukee. All of these groups came together to tell the stories of Wisconsinites and their role in World War I. I was introduced to them because of all of the events that you see on the left here that I was coordinating and curating uh, during that time, but I was brought on to consult with them to talk about the artist perspective, like the art uh, and the veteran perspective, but the serendipitous part of this connection was they were researching why it still matters at the same time the Wisconsin Veterans Museum was looking at why it still matters. I'm researching art from World War I, trying to figure out why it still matters, and it started having an effect on me. It opened a door and where another one door opened about why it still matters, another door opened and then another door. And all of these rabbit holes that I was finding myself falling into changed my perspective. It gave me a whole new perspective on everything. It highly affected the way I started looking at and analyzing art. And it reignited the inspiration for why I created the Veteran Print Project, to bridge this gap, to be a conduit 
for the veteran to the disconnected society. Now, collaborating in those 2018 events motivated me to research topics, excuse me, motivated me to research topics and situations that I was completely unaware of about World War I. And it pushed me to refer back and to reconsider what I really thought I had already understood about the art history that I had studied. So thank you to art history. I will always use art history as a guidepost to help me evaluate the artwork that's being made and, and the reasons why and maybe how my perspective changes. So again, during this time, there were all these events happening about World War I worldwide. Uh, and there was these series of exhibits that were happening in Madison. And we were all asking, why does it still matter? And then warrior writers invited me to come to Philadelphia to teach about veteran artists in World War I. And they asked me to teach about the global war on terror, the post 9-11 veteran artists. Um, and I was brought there to share information with their moderators who would be hosting facilitated conversations as they're part of the dialogue on a uh, dialogue on war, uh, National Endowment for the Humanities grant. Um, and their program was about reintegration and the arts. So a good art historian is gonna compare and contrast to defend an argument. Unintentionally, warrior writers gave me the perfect compare and contrast opportunity for me to connect World War I with global war on terror in a way that I had never seen before. And all of a sudden, the world was starting to make sense to me. Up to that point, I had not put the pieces together of the eerie similarities between these two generations. I knew I was drawn to modernism during my art history courses, but I hadn't yet identified the extent of that connection until this moment. Uh, specifically, the artwork that was being created by both generations. Um, all of this research was coming together and it was guiding me to these thoughts. After World War I, artists were desperate to find a visual language that depicted the complexities of the catastrophic apocalypse they had just experienced as both victim and as participants. Uh, society was wounded and it was searching for a new identity that was both splintered and at times unconscious or at best, uncomfortably numb. The resulting artistic era was filled with angled, disconnected fragments in abstracted realities. Surreal images revealed confusing truths of, implaus of an implausible existence. The rapidly advancing technologies that had brought an overwhelming force of destruction to the battlefield were being presented in societal portraits of humans existing in a distracted theater of complicit detachment from humanity. The armistice would provide some sense of closure and these artists would go on to define what we now know as modernism. In my own personal post-war experience, I was studying art history and I kept finding myself asking, why does this genre, why does modernism connect with me so much? And why does it still matter? And my answer is simple. The artists returning from our military experiences in the global war on terror in today's modern society, we are also seeking a new creative language to both depict and inform a disconnected society. But rather than abstracted realities and surreal interventions, we're immersing ourselves in our communities. We're actively engaging in a participatory and a social process. Is the transformative nature of this process a metaphor for reintegration? Let me describe the processes we're doing and maybe we'll reveal a deeper metaphor. Marks are made on metal. That metal's dipped into acid, so a chemical alteration will provide a void for ink to occupy until it's pressed into a sheet of paper to reveal an image. This is the process to create multiples of the same thing. Rag is being cut down. It's beaten to a pulp, placed in a vat, scooped up, and pressed into a new sheet of paper. This is the process of deconstruction and reformation. 
pliable clay is kneaded and folded. It is of the earth, mineral and water molded into a form. It is exposed to high temps and it, that allow it to harden and thus it is strengthened. This is the process of malleable fortitude. Reintegration implies that there's a return to something that existed before. Today's veteran artists, we are revealing the implausibility of that charge. We are seeking a more literal word, a, a more literal meaning to the word reintegration. Reintegration is the act of restoring elements that were disparate to unity. Community immersion rec recreates the camaraderie of service in an effort to deflect isolation. Global War on Terror artists, we don't have an armistice. In a state of perpetual war, we don't have an opportunity to find closure. Thus, our, the outcome of our process is transformation, not closure, and our narrative will remain transient. So I'll ask you this, should healing be a requirement for transformation? And if so, let's think about who is being healed. How often do civilians think the veteran is seeking healing when the veteran believes they're seeking to heal society and not the self? Now, I can't take credit for those last few words. Jesse Albrecht, oh, it skipped it, sorry. Jesse Albrecht, I'll find him here. Here he is. Jesse Albrecht, who you see here, uh, shared that sentiment about healing in an interview he did when he discussed his work. He challenged this idea of who's really being healed. And I love Jesse's question about healing. And it means a lot to me because every single art talk I go to, the dominating topic is not the art, but about healing. And that's okay. But I like that Jesse pushes it back to you to really think about who's being healed, who needs to be healed. Um, and there's no right or wrong answer to this. I just really like that he pushes it back. And it's not just on us to absorb this concept of healing. Um, Jesse's an incredible human being. I served with him in Iraq. He's making a name for himself in contemporary ceramics right now and in contemporary arts right now. So a shout out to Jesse Albrecht. Now I shared those thoughts with you about my revelation in 2018, because even though they were written as part of my participation in the greatest war rock and roll history show, they also prompted me to really reevaluate the direction that my creative process was taking me. The way I started after 2018, the way I started discussing my artwork shifted. The way I started looking at the veteran print project shifted. The way in which I look at artwork created by veterans has shifted. Throughout this artist talk today, I've circled back to this narrative to show how this all ties together and to show how I'm moving forward with my practice as both artist and as curator. When I first wrote those ideas in 2018, um, we had not yet removed ourselves from Afghanistan, right? And that those words now are even more profound to me because they're still yet that we still don't have closure. And that's why I say our narrative will remain uh, transient. We'll continue, to con we'll continue to have conversations about this topic and we'll continue to understand what it means to be in a status of perpetual war uh, and what that looks like in a disconnected society. Uh, what does it mean to be in perpetual war in a conflict that's not in your own backyard? Uh, when you don't go outside every morning with a reminder hey, we're at war, right? Like, how do you have conversations with a society that is complicit in what is happening and completely unaware of what the realities are of war? Uh, I try to do that in my artwork. I try to use symbolism and storytelling to shed light on topics that I find difficult to discuss, because I really do. I have a hard time discussing certain things. Um, but once I, I try to build a narrative in these pieces of artwork. And that narrative helps me defend my work and it helps me expand on it. And once I'm able to expand on it, then I'm able to have much deeper conversations. And there's a lot of artists that will lean back toward mythology, will lean toward Shakespeare, that will lean toward um, imagined worlds to help bridge the gap and tell that story of hard 
topics to discuss, right? Artwork has the power to do that. I love talking about World War I artists because the things that I learn as I learn more about that artwork helps me make much more sense of the world, the world of the artwork that's being created by the emerging veteran artists right now. Uh, and I've started to write about my contemporaries through an art history lens. And that's been extremely informative. Um, writing about my contemporaries reminds me about the veteran print project and how I discuss the process of somebody else absorbing your story to my veteran participants. Um, when I have a veteran who is an artist, uh, the process is a little bit different because for the most part, our artists are civilians who, civilian printmakers who are interviewing veterans. The veteran doesn't make the artwork, the artist makes the artwork. Um, but when I have a veteran who is a printmaker like myself, I'm a printmaker and a veteran, I ask the veteran to offer their story to an artist and not to make an autobiographical print. And then I ask them to interview another veteran, hopefully somebody that's of a different branch of service, a different gender, a different generation, somebody with a completely different experience. And this will help reveal your own personal biases. It helps you gain an understanding of an experience other than your own. And I encourage that because I was able to see firsthand the results uh, when I was interviewing, when I started interviewing other veterans, I revealed my own preconceived notions and I had to bypass my personal story in an effort to genuinely capture another's experience with integrity and with empathy. Being able to write about my contemporaries in the veteran art movement in real time, looking at the deeper psychological meaning of the way we're creating work or the methodologies we're using or how we approach our craft, knowing these people personally and trying to write about them has been really interesting. Uh, it's helped me consider how others might be examining my artwork, how others might be uh, analyzing my story, my artwork. It's important for us to understand how people interpret our stories. How people are interpreting my story or your artwork is always gonna be from a different lens, right? Through a different lens. Um, the Veteran Print Project helped me see that by me allowing somebody else to portray my story. But it's hard when you tell your story and somebody else translates it through a new point of view. In this same front, I worked with Martin McClendon at Carthage College in Kenosha, Wisconsin. He's a professor of theater there, and they do this series of verbatim plays where they interview veterans and they create a script using the actual words of the veterans and make a cohesive plot tying all these stories together. These are award-winning plays. They're incredible. Um, and I've been lucky enough to participate twice for two different uh, events. But the first time I saw my story portrayed by an, a really talented actress, I had this moment where I thought, wow, is that how others hear and see my story? Is that how they see my actions? Um, Cause that's not what I felt or that's not what I meant. Um, but our words and our actions though very personal to us are not always the way others absorb them. And it's not always the way they're going to translate them. One of the reasons I started the Veteran Print Project was yes, absolutely to create dialogue. But another reason I started it was based off of my reaction to students in the classes I was attending in art school uh, that were motivated to depict military imagery without having any personal connection to it. I did that before I joined the army, so I get it, I get it. The imagery is cool, right? But these students didn't have any personal connection to that imagery. And with the increase in gaming platforms, the development of these realistic simulation games, we have a new generation of artists creating work that is digitally super realistic. And they're creating it based off of imagery that I really hope is research-based. Object research, they're definitely doing. They understand the mechanism of war. But human research, I'm not sure. I know there are veterans in the industry because I was studying with them at Wake Tech but I'm not sure of the personal connections that are being made between artists and imagery 
that's being created. I'm a huge advocate for research being a major component of the artist experience, because I think there's a responsibility to understand what you're creating and why. Uh, and not all artists will agree with me. Not all artists believe there needs to be a research section, uh, excuse me, research practice in conjunction with your artist practice. I'm one of the people that is an advocate for research. And of course, I understand there's going to be parody, pastiche, fictionalized worlds, and a lot of ways to take artistic creative license, but I just don't think that ignorance should be one. Because there's a reality, there's a real world behind what's being documented visually. And there are personal human stories from people who wear that uniform. We've created so many fictionalized, dehumanized, overheroized, romanticized versions of military service that it makes it really just too easy to put this character out there in full battle rattle with a neck gator up to their goggles, right? We have essentially, in this world, made our connection to military service, to warfare, faceless. My initial hope for the Veteran Print Project was to connect the civilian with the veteran to start a dialogue, to help civilians use art as a catalyst for conversation, and to help the veteran feel comfortable sharing their story in an effort to find a shared human experience. Veteran Print Project was one of the earlier, like post 9-11 was one of the earlier efforts to bridge this civilian veteran gap. And after just over 12 years, over a hundred prints created with over a hundred, depicting over a hundred veteran stories, the Veteran Print Project has helped narrow that gap of the civilian veteran to got, excuse me, that gap of the civilian veteran divide. But that gap still remains. And unfortunately, we have some new terrain to cover. There is now a veteran to veteran gap. And I'm not talking about the generational veteran to veteran divide, the Vietnam veterans trying to welcome in the Gulf War or World War II to Vietnam. That's not the veteran to veteran generational gap I'm talking about. The veteran to veteran gap exists because we continue to remain in Iraq and we only recently left Afghanistan and those stories continue to evolve. New veterans continue to come out of the military. And as those stories evolve, they're revealing a great discrepancy. For example, my experience in Mosul, Iraq in 2003, as you can see pictured in the palace here uh, uh, from 2003, my experience is gonna be vastly different from somebody returning home from Mosul, Iraq today. That's, that's the rub, like what's left of the palace. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, the soldiers coming home today, their perspective and their interaction with the Iraqi people is going to be completely different than my uh, interaction with the Iraqi people. The landscape of the country is completely different. And the reflections on the mission of why we're there are incredibly changed. Since my time in Iraq, there have been four different United States presidents. Some of the service members now deployed to the area were not even born when 9-11 happened. Until 2019, there were people serving in Afghanistan who were born after the terror attack, after the terror attack that prompted that conflict. There's also a disconnect from society to the familiar to the familial loss of a loved one being gone for long periods of time. Outside of the military or beyond the cliche welcome home surprise videos, we don't really see the impact on the families and the day-to-day -day lives of a loved one serving overseas. The stories of the family members just aren't being told. And I can tell you firsthand, I've been on both sides of it. It's harder to be on the home front. And I think there are people that will disagree with me, but it's hard to live in the unknown of what is really happening over there. When you're deployed, you have some sense of what's going on. You have an idea of the danger that you're in, but when you're on, on the home front, you have no idea. Uh, you, don't, you don't get a lot of that information. So those stories need to be told. The stories of the family member are really important. And this concept, while it's not new, is something that my confidence has grown that I wanna highlight. One of the great things about working in the Veteran Print Project is that I get to meet a lot of different veteran organizations. And one of them that's near and dear to my heart is the American GI Forum. And 
through the American GI Forum, I've, I've grown to understand how they embrace the family member as an honorary veteran. The family member is a veteran as well because they live that experience with you. They have their own side of the story that should be told. Now, the Print Project is looking at ways to make that effort happen. We're continuing our partnership with the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design, and we want to start telling the stories of the family, not just of the veteran, because that support system is the other side of the military narrative that we don't hear about. Now, an interesting part of running the Veteran Print Project, while simultaneously trying to nurture my own art practice and thrive as a curator of veteran art, is understanding how all of these separate things influence my thinking and how I motivate myself to move forward. Uh, sometimes this requires that I distance myself from the Veteran Print Project. Logistically, I can't completely disconnect because the project as, as it's currently structured would cease to exist. And that's okay, someday that might be the case. But as new collaborations continue to emerge, I'll make sure I keep the project on track. But what's curious is that as my own personal narrative shift, as my perspective shifts on world politics and my perspective shifts on my role in the grand scheme of things, I'm expecting to see a similar shift in the veteran print project narratives. I'm expecting to see the veteran stories evolve in the same, you know, in parallel to mine. And that's just not the case, right? That's not reality, which is why I need to remind myself to distance myself because VPP is not about me, me, me. It's about the participants and their stories. Um, and the stories that I expect to come out of each new round of Veteran Print Project prints are not always the stories that get told. I always keep thinking I'm going to see certain stories and those aren't the ones that are, are getting told, but it's those unexpected stories that help remind me of the big diversity of the human sentiment. Veteran Print Project helps, re, helps me remain connected to experiences that are, are other than my own. It helps me remain connected to the stories of today's veterans and of the veterans in the past. Uh, and it works as a bit of a barometer for me to differentiate how my own perspective changes in relation to the general shared experience and whether that's changing or it's not changing. Uh, the stories that are coming out of the Veteran Print Project are what we had hoped would come out, which are individual, personalized narratives about a shared human experience. These narratives are visually reflected by an artist who I really hope is really connected to them as well. Uh, the variety of stories range from the whimsical to the philosophical, from the traumatic to the joyous, and some are even grounded enough to focus beyond the military subject matter as part of their narrative. Now, if my measurement for success is based on the principles of the original concept of the Veteran Print Project, and that's to share a conversation that will prompt the creation of a piece of art to continue that dialogue, then yeah, we've succeeded. Um, but the Veteran Print Project, it's, it's also changed me. Uh, as incredible as it is to hear all of these various stories and the perspective of each individual participant, it can take its toll. Especially when my own prof my other professional endeavors uh, require me to be also be immersed in first person narratives that accentuate this fact based timeline of military history. The reality of studying history of something that you were a part of can be very challenging psychologically. And at times it can make it difficult to remain objective, especially when the war carries on and there is no finality to that timeline. The cyclical nature of history allows us to see how far we've come or perhaps how far we've retreated or sometimes it just reveals that some things will remain the same and they just won't ever change. Um, it's in those moments though where I think some veterans, I won't speak for all veterans, some veterans start to ask, well, then what was it all for? Sometimes it's nice to reveal the connection to a generation that came before you. This repetitive nature of history allows, uh, this repetitive nature of history creates traditions, right? And the sharing of traditions can bring great pride, but some traditions can also create great divides. 
And not everybody always has a part, has a chance to be a part of a tradition. Not ever, not all the time are people welcome to be invited into that tradition. Everybody doesn't always have a seat at the table because history is not always kind. And that's just a reminder to me to continue to ask, why does it still matter? My personal work is transitioning from using visual language that reflects my military experiences toward new investigations, investigations of the celebrated topics within my own family's lineage and my own family folklore. I'm trying to gain an understanding of family behaviors that ultimately chose to reject our Mexican lineage in favor of elevating and celebrating our Spanish heritage. My work is now trying to create visual defenses to fight back against the denial of that part of my identity. After so many years of considering the realities of the celebrated militarism in this country and my role within that narrative, I'm now wanting to return to the roots of my own personal history. And I think like many in our communities today, I'm considering new ways to commemorate the past new ways that don't require or expect us to build monuments to worship uh, or finding heroes that we gonna, we're gonna promote. Um, there will always be layered symbols within my work. That will always be a part of my work. Um, and it will draw meaning from personal trauma all the way to the amplified collective trauma over the last few years. And maybe, hopefully, in all of this, in this new creation of work, maybe, I will be able to create a designated space to remember. So thank you all for listening to me. Here you see some current and up, upcoming exhibits. Uh, Relative Perception comes down in just this week. Uh, and in Milwaukee, Osei Can You See is on exhibit in, Phil in uh, Pennsylvania through December. I'm really excited. Um, We'll be at Syracuse University National Veteran Resource Center Gallery, which is brand new. And I'm an alumni of their entrepreneur program for women veterans. So I'm excited to be one of the first exhibits in that new space. And then uh, save the date. Uh, I was a, you know, a, a curatorial fellow for the inaugural Veteran Art Triennial. And our second one is coming in March of this year. And uh, I'm uh, excited that I'll have some of my work on exhibit in that. And then if you visit the Wisconsin Veterans Museum website on our events page, I host a monthly drink and draw and it still remains virtual uh, where I pick an object from our collect collection or a story and then we, we, we sketch and we have some fun uh, while drawing. I, I did pretty good on time. I think I left us room for questions. Um, here's a slide with all of my uh, contact info, but I'll, I'll stop talking now and open it up for questions. I appreciate that you shared so, so many, um, you know, artists of note, artists who you've collaborated with, uh, organizations, et cetera. Um, but I guess I'd kick it off by saying, are there any other organizations, uh, both, you know, in support of veterans and uh, the arts and veterans uh, collaborative uh, projects or artists that you weren't able to sort of embed that uh, you would like to amplify and share with us? Gosh, yeah, you know, there's, it's funny, as I was, as creating this, there's so, so many, I've been really lucky to participate with so many different people. Um, the, the, there's a theater group in Wisconsin that, that has grown um, called Feast of Crispian, and they use the words of Shakespeare uh, to work with veterans, to use those words and find out just how relevant they are today to today's uh that um, service members that are coming out of the military. Um, and I had just started working with them to um, try to bring more programs to the Wisconsin Veterans Museum, um, but they are national if, if they're called Feast of Crispian, um, based out of Wisconsin. Uh, of course, the VA system has incredible programs that are accessible out there. Jason Moon does Warrior Songs, which is essentially a veteran print project doing using songwriting. Um, I mentioned Martin McClendon at Carthage College and the Verbatim Theater. Um, the Emerging Veteran Artists, there's, um, I should find the website. I should have put it up there for all of the, the links to the artists that are working in this movement right now because there's performance art 
theater, poetry, writing, prose. Um, a lot of writing programs exist out there. Um, I can always send a link. There's a, I have a long list of, of um, contacts to go to. One thing that you mentioned um, repeatedly was that, you know, collecting these first person stories can really take a toll, like emotionally and mentally. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'd be curious to know how you care for yourself, uh, both as a, as a creative and also just as a, as a human being and a veteran. How do you, how do you care for yourself in all of that work? I think learning to communicate and actually identifying that it was actually affecting me. Um, I'm a, I've been a storyteller the, my whole life. The whole reason the print project started was because I, we were all isolating. Veterans were isolated and only talking to each other. And so I knew we had to find ways to talk to other people. And, and when I started realizing that I was losing my ability to or want to tell my story or that I didn't really want, that I was actually finding a new way to isolate I I'm lucky I have a really good support system um and the vet working at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum I am able to be open and honest with my colleagues about how this affects me and so being able to have um colleagues that are also very aware of that that maybe they need to take the reins of something even though you know you might be really good at it even though you might be the best candidate for this maybe stepping in and saying, why don't we take this one? You, you, you take some time to, to just be who you are. And then finally, I will say in the last couple of years, I finally did start going to the VA and talk to somebody. I didn't think I needed that for almost 12 years. And I think there's a, everybody's timeline is different. Um, I was told as soon as I got out of the army that I needed to be talking to somebody. And I was like, but I'm already talking. It's not a big deal. Uh, and it took about 12 years before I actually sat down formally to talk to somebody. So that's, I think, support system, being really grateful to have a support system and being able to maybe see when somebody else needs one and you can be the support system for them. Well, hello, Yvette, long time. Hello. It's my roommate from the Mission Continues when we did a fellowship together. <laughs> yeah, so probably about 10 years now. <laughs> um, so I, I do work in the VA. I work in um, a brand new community engagement position in the suicide prevention program. And I just, there's one of the um, priority areas that we have is promoting connectedness and improving care transitions. This is such a huge aspect of that. And I just wondered if there was any connection to um, any of the state governor challenges, because that that's a VA SAMHSA um, collab, like partnership to um, prevent suicide in veteran and military connected families at the state level. So it convenes a statewide coalition, but the priority areas are all aligned with what you're doing and what I, I mean, the whole time you're talking, I, you know, I know I'm looking at it through a suicide prevention lens, but that's what it is. Yeah. I mean, you know? and I just wondered if there was, if there was any connection to even though it, like, cause at all 50 States have a governor's challenge. Yeah. Do you mean, does veteran print project have that connection? Like if there's any to like either any like specific suicide prevention um, programming or groups or anything within that arena. I mean, I've done stuff like that before, but nothing in the works right now. I mean, I'm always open to make that connection. And uh, because I was working with the Wisconsin Veterans Museum, we're a state, state um, organization or a state mm -hmm. educa an education component of the Wisconsin Department of Veterans Affairs. So we have that direct connection to the Department of Veterans Affairs, and they've brought me in and embraced the Veteran Print Project in that way. But that's sort of a where my role at the museum has evolved to is like, how can we, how do we use the arts to create that connection to the statewide? And now I'm actually work there, but I do consultant work with the museum. Now I relocated to North Carolina. And so now I'm also a little bit, I'm able to not be a state employee anymore. So okay. I can sort of expand nationwide and still emphasize the great work that Wisconsin's doing and still continue to consult with them um, but we can look at ways that this project, we've tried to get it with the VA a while back, but it, for whatever reason, it just didn't um, flesh out. 
Well, yeah, that's, it's a big bureaucracy, Yeah, <laughs> but, that's yeah. Where, but, but that's where like a community engagement position yeah. with it, that's working outwardly with a lot of different, I mean, they're the coalitions that I'm a part of, like have faith-based, have schools, have like a lot of the colleges and universities, a lot of veteran friendly employers. I mean, there's, it's comprised of a lot of different stakeholders, but I just see so many connection points to a lot of the suicide prevention work that's going on because it's a public health approach now um, will, to suicide prevention. Yeah, I was gonna say, I will say the really cool thing is I am with collective care. I really am seeing institutions like Chafee really start to embrace the idea of collective care and utilizing um, different formats to address that. And, and they are embracing that within the veteran community. And what's nice about connecting that to veteran community is um, the veteran community has that same sort of like diversity of thought in the in world, in, in, in humanity, right? We have so many different pers points of view, perspective, experiences within the military component that we need to be helping uh, veterans with every different perspective have a place to discuss and have a place that outlet to to share their story. So yeah, I'm I'm I I think there's always opportunity, and I'm happy to continue that um, and yeah. and figure out what we can do because it's it's important. It, there, I I just don't think it's a coincidence that you kept you kept circling into my purview because, like I said, there's just a lot of connection points. So I I'll, I'd just love to have a conversation with you. Yeah, we definitely go a little bit more in depth, not just to catch up. But <laughs> oh, wait, that's always a plus. No, but yeah, for sure, we'll we'll be linking up. And then if anybody else has ideas out there too, I know Vera Roddy's in the audience. She's doing work with uh, Gulf War veterans, but doing work with uh, another NEH grant. And um, I can put you in contact with her and like the work she's doing also with veterans and specifically a lot of work with women veterans. And that's, that's what, I mean, I used to manage the women veterans program. So I know like these were the type of events and these were the type of programs that I really just anything to get women to tell their story, especially since it's a story that's not heard enough. Yeah. It's tough to get women to share their stories. It is one of the toughest things out there. I've been really lucky. The women veterans in Wisconsin are my family, are the reason why I'm here, uh, why my career is where it's at. Um, but even those women who are always very generous with their story, uh, when it comes to like public platforms, their help, women are good about pushing other women forward, right? And well, putting ourselves on the on the back shelf um, and helping each other learn to put our stories forward is, is important. It wasn't as important to me when I first got out, but I didn't understand it. And now I really have a much greater understanding of that need and importance um so yeah and thank you for coming today i'm really excited you're here. I, I yeah i wanted to hear more about the project and i i saw that this was going on and it was going to be a lot more in depth so well, thank you I got invited. um i have i see there's a question about the process right cindy you want to talk about the process um so the way the way the project was started was you know, obviously working at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum, I had access to oral histories. And originally the process was a recorded oral history was given to the artist and they never met the veteran. Um, and then when we moved the project to Colorado State, the oral history component wasn't as accessible as it was in Wisconsin. So we had to have the veteran meet the artist out of logistics. And that ended up creating much more, a much richer experience because you actually are engaging in a conversation and you and that's where the idea of dialogue really blossomed. And so I work with organizations, the Veteran Print Project essentially it starts, it's a, it works best like when you have a university that has a veteran community and a, a art community like printmakers, um, but it's not requirement, it's not a requirement. Um, essentially, if I have a group of veterans that are willing to tell their story, I'll find artists that are willing to create the prints. Um, I'm kind of a stickler. It has to be printmaking for my project, um, hand, hand pulled prints. Um, we've evolved a little, but there's other, people have modeled the project in different mediums, but print project is prints. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really about finding artists who can create 
a hand pulled print and having veterans that want to tell their story. Um, it's funny. Sometimes I have a harder time finding artists and I have all these veterans in the in waiting. And then sometimes I have like in Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design, sometimes I have, I've been working with Rena Yoon, their professor. So it's for a class. So I have a specific number of artists and she's really strict. So she doesn't just let them get away with making one print per semester. She makes them interview three different veterans and do an addition on three different veterans. So that makes it hard for me because then I have to find, let's say I have 10 students in the class. Now I have to find 30 veterans. <laughs> so it, it, it's, uh, it, it's kind of a balancing act of your participants. But if you're doing it at your institution, right, a lot, you'll, you'll be surprised how many student veterans you have and some that won't identify as veterans or artists who actually are veterans that won't identify their veteran experience, right? And so for me, the print project works well because I offer the opportunity that you don't actually have to share. Your story doesn't have to be about the military if you don't want it to be. Um, you just happen to be a veteran and you're sharing a, a story. And sometimes through conversations that military experience organically comes out because they've built a trust. And now they feel comfortable telling you a little bit more about who they are. But if you allow people to tell whatever side of the story they want, then you don't have to, uh, people feel better about sharing when they don't feel forced or coerced into any expected um, result, right? Take the pressure off. That's why I tell the artists, yes, the artwork's beautiful, but that's not the point of this all. Like, and I don't want to discredit that because I get some really amazing, beautiful prints. I have a lot of beautiful prints in the collection and I'm really grateful. But the stories that have come out kind of, it, it, it goes up a little higher. <laughs> I value the stories. I'm wondering too with that, are they given a prompt? Like when they, to share their story and it's like, what, what prompt are the... So I actually give them a handout that uh, is taken from oral history best practices. And I, for, for the print project, I use the Library of Congress like sample questions for veterans because another reason why I started the project was it's not as much anymore, but when we were first getting out in 0304, people were, you know, the whole thing of, oh, did you kill anybody, right? Like learning to have proper conversations. Uh, and I always compare it to when you meet somebody, you don't introduce yourself, hi, I'm a vet, and then when you're introducing yourself, say, oh, were you abused as a child? Like, that's not a question that you would ever ask somebody when you first meet them. So why would you ask them those invasive questions about being a veteran? So I give you some sample oral history best practice questions to get the, the started. But like I said, I was a cook in the army. So for me, the best advice I give is to talk about food. Um, food prompts so much memory. And I always tell people, this is how I got to know my soldiers. Uh, if you talk about food, then you know people's likes and dislikes. You know how they were raised because you know, did they have food? Did they not have food? If they did have food, who was preparing it? Uh, what were they preparing? Uh, what is food that makes you happy? What is food that makes you nostalgic? Um, but you get to know a lot about a person simply by the food that they eat um, and their access to food. So. When all else fails, have a conversation about food. Um, it works. Music too, but food is really the common denominator. We all have to eat. Can I ask a follow-up, Eva? Um, yeah. I'm curious if these conversations are um, documented as part of the process. Are you Sorry, if these conversations are documented what? As part of your process, are they being so, like I said, we originally had the oral histories, like we were trying to bring a new generation of veterans at the Wisconsin, I was doing my work study at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum, and we were trying to bring a new generation of oral histories uh, to get recorded before we forgot them, right? Don't wait 50 years to record that oral history. So we had access to that. Um, and then I, my dream was always to have the recorded oral history be the component of it. And that just hasn't really happened. Um, if an institution has access to recording of the oral histories, then we'll do it. My thing is about recording the oral histories. Um, sorry, so I, I, before I get to that point, the artist has to give me a paragraph on the, like the print, right? So that goes with the print. 
the narrative of the story. But the recording of oral histories, if it's not in an institution of humanities, like the Veterans Museum has an oral history collection. So you sign a release form, it's recorded, you have a right to make it private or public, right? Or like Library of Congress, there's release forms. <clears throat> I'm very particular about um, rights and privileges and also privacy, rights to privacy. And so for me, I don't have the capacity to properly store uh, the, this archive. So if I have a, an institution where we can put those recorded archives, then we'll do that. But for the veteran print project, it's just one level that I'm not, I'm not privy to. I, I, am, I am going to be, we did reach out to the artists at our 10 year anniversary, uh, I'm sorry, to the participants to see how they've changed over 10 years. And we did add some like follow-up narrative uh, to their experience. And that's something I wanna work on in the next couple of years. And Zoom is going to offer me this new ability to actually maybe record some of those conversations of the experience of the Veteran Print Project, um, and they can talk about their print and and in that in that capacity. Um, Rebecca had asked a question in the chat before, and I can oh, okay. go ahead and share it. Am I cutting out too, or am I sounding? No, good? I hear you. Okay, cool. Um, so um, Rebecca had noted that. Uh, you often say that art has a power to be transformative, and we 100% mm -hmm. agree. Um, but, and also that healing and art as therapy are, are not necessarily the goal. Can you talk about the intersections and differences between healing, art as therapy, and the transformative nature of art making? They seem like um, interesting and important distinctions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think at one point in time, I consider going into art therapy. And I, I think that art therapy is extremely valuable. And the people in that field are doing incredible work. And art therapy allows folks to come to the table and use the creative process to work through a trauma, to work as therapy. And the artists that I talk about or my work, um, well, therapeutic um, isn't always the main goal. Um, and I think there's a lot of us that I get kind of, sometimes I, 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 I struggle because I, I can get a little personally snobby about it but it's because I've been drawing and painting since I was a kid and so I've always my goal has always been to be an artist and often we get lumped into art therapy but um, then I do these presentations and I realized how much of the artwork actually does result in healing right of some sort um, I think the transformation um, is from personal realizations that maybe revelations that come out of that process, right? Maybe it, you see your experience. Like I talked a lot about seeing your experience through a different lens, like somebody else observing uh, your experience and, and giving it back to you. It's hard to see that sometimes it's hard to really like with that play. I, the reason why I wanted to talk about the play, the verbatim play was I sunk into my chair the night that that was performed because I couldn't believe that that's how they really performed my exact words back right but the way it was acted out was not at all the way I saw myself and I actually had to revisit some of my friends that that personal narrative that dialogue was taken from um I revisited friends that that interaction had happened with to see which way was real right like the way I saw it or the way that it was portrayed and oddly it was much more of the way it was portrayed and we talk about it took me 12 years to finally go to the VA well that that was sort of that realization um you know I've been on this soapbox for years like we're not art therapy yet it's taken me 12 years to realize I finally needed to talk to somebody because all these stories I was sharing that I thought I was just fine were actually indicators of you should be talking to somebody else. And I didn't realize that about myself until I had been out long enough and started um, interacting with veterans who had just got out. And I was listening to the way they would talk and uh, their behaviors. And I was like, whoa, we, we need to like, like calm down. Not, I hate to say the word calm down, but like when they, like some of the veterans coming out are just like so amped up that 
I was able to step outside of my body and see how I was 10, 12 years ago. And a light bulb went off. I was like, oh, that's how people were hearing what I was talking about. And I thought I was just fine, like floating on air. Look at me. I'm telling all these stories. And so I think um, that's the transformation and the transformative process in the art. For me, it's the literal transformation, right? Like we have chosen mediums that are literally require transformation in order to get the end result. So combat paper, for example, you are literally tearing apart your uniform and recreating it into something new and beautiful. It's a whole new life to that memory. It's a tangible recreation of that. Printmaking, I always say it mimics the military experience. You know, you have to have a lot of discipline. You have to have a lot of be, uh, intestinal fortitude, as we say in the military. Um, it, it's the process of unknown outcomes. And you do all of this because you're a little crazy and you have to be a little disciplined. And the end result is to spit out multiples of the same, just like in the military, right? But each print still holds its intrinsic values that makes it an individual, an original. Um, so we might all be standing in uniform looking exactly the same, but each one of us in a formation still holds our own identity. And that's a print to me. Um, obviously in clay, I mean, the metaphor is really more on the nose, like it has to go through the fire in order for it to harden. And the only way it'll have its ultimate strength is until it goes under that fire. Um, that to me is military experience. So I think there's just the, the mediums that the performance art finds its way in that as well. Um, there's a literal transition of something that started here and it changes to end up here. Um, and in painting, you get that, but painting kind of is what it is, right? I mean, it depends on the, the way you paint. Um, but I just think my own personal artwork shifted because I liked artwork that challenged me that like something that isn't going to just be easy and given you, I need to see that change happen in real, real time. Um, and I think the longer we're out, the long, the better we can have these conversations uh, about comparing these processes to our experiences or our, 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 um, our perspective on these experiences. Thank you.